One of the most common complaints of patients visiting their doctors is fatigue, lack of energy. And there are also many medications that can make people tired all the time, you know, antidepressants and tranquilizers and muscle relaxants and just about uh, every medication. Sleeping out there. pills the day after, blood pressure pills and so forth. Right. And now we can add another drug to this list statins and I was thinking you know statins are like the most popular medication on the market Lipitor is the biggest selling drug in the world Crestor is in the top five well it seems to me that they might have stock in some of these <laughs> coffee houses because the coffee houses are <laughs> well, very they, popular they should. Yeah. with people trying to wake up and get more energy and not be so tired so you know, it could be the statins, too. <laughs> We're certainly in a drug culture, aren't we? Indeed. There was an article published in Archives of Internal Medicine in June of 2012 looking at a 1,000 people who were on different kinds of statins and comparing them to placebo and then looking to see how much loss of energy there was and how much fatigue with the exertion that there was. And it turned out to be a lot. Somewhere around 40% had worsened energy or exertional fatigue, 20% had both, and 10% were really severely incapacitated by their fatigue. So what are some of the other side effects that statins have? Statins are turning out to have a lot of side effects, and it's not really a surprise because what are we doing? We're putting a foreign substance into the body, and that creates changes that our metabolism has to adjust to. You know, I want to just clarify here, too. When we talk about statins, we're talking about cholesterol-lowering drugs. Exactly. And, and at least one class of them, because there are many different classes of them. But the statins are the ones that are the most common. So we're looking at the side effects, so-called side effects. They aren't side effects at all. They are the expected effects in an awful lot of people. You're seeing things like liver disease and peripheral neuropathy and muscle necrosis. Rather than just having weak muscles, people tend to have painful and sore muscles, so they can't do the work because of pain. Uh, because of the, of the rhabdomyolysis, which is the disintegration of muscles, liberating a, a uh, substance called myoglobin that, when in large amounts, can actually go down the kidneys and cause clog it up and cause kidney failure. So you could wind up actually dying from kidney failure, and it can cause peripheral neuropathies. Your risk for type two diabetes goes up. There's some questions about its association with cancer. So all of a sudden, this miracle drug, okay, that's being, that a lot of people are talking about, we should put it in the water and give it to everybody because we're going to lower the incidence of heart attacks and strokes, is a myth. Another thing that it does that not everybody knows about is that it uh, prevents your CoQ10 from developing. That's a real good point. It actually blocks the production, okay, of CoQ10 in the body. And coenzyme Q10 is absolutely necessary for people who, uh, to be able to make energy. So uh, we don't even mention that a lot of the time because the drug companies don't want to look at it. Maybe that's why people are tired. It could be. We know that for people who are having problems with uh, muscle pain, that if you give them coenzyme Q10, the risk for developing that goes down quite a bit. And CoQ10 does a lot of other things besides make energy. It's a powerful antioxidant. It helps in congestive heart failure a lot of the time in people with hypertension or high cholesterol or diabetes uh, or chemotherapy with certain kinds of drugs like adriamycin. It can actually block the heart failure that can develop from it and periodontal diseases and Parkinson's disease and some of it sometimes are using it for cancer. So this is a really important nutrient that we can make some of uh, in our bodies, but supplementing it in a situation when you're on a statin drug seems like a no-brainer. It seems like it's almost malpractice for a doctor not to prescribe it, it would, but because it's a natural supplement, maybe well, that's why they don't. Well, I don't know. I think that generally there's a polarization between doctors and nutritionists. Doctors tend to work with drugs and they don't know much about nutrition because they're not trained in it and they know even less about supplements. So when it comes to talking about your particular field, of course, mine is the best. And if I happen to be a doctor, it's new it's using drugs and surgeries and technologies. And if I'm a nutritionist, it's looking at cell biochemistry and talking about food, supplements, and other kinds of natural things that we can take to make our, our bodies function better. So the best way to deal with high cholesterol is to have a healthy lifestyle and not depend on taking drugs. Oh, for sure. And, and if our lifestyle is healthy, even if our cholesterol is high, as long as our ratios are right, there's no need to treat it in almost every situation. Certainly for primary prevention, it's not 
not indicated. And lots of studies have been done on that recently. So the idea of putting statins in the water is bypassing. We should also be very careful prescribing any medicine because when we do, they always cause problems with our metabolism. And some of those problems that we see can be life-threatening and can make life pretty uncomfortable.